Good morning. I'm Karen Evely. Um, I'm the head of the Improving Lives programme in Welsh Government. And uh, my colleague Hazel Powell is our Welsh Government's uh, Learning Disability Nursing Advisor. My apologies as well, as you can probably hear. It really um, great timing, but I'm losing my voice. <laughs> I wasn't sure what the audience was today, so we thought it would be useful to just first of all just take a step of who, you know what what it is for people with a learning disability, what it actually means. I came into this post last September, having worked in health policy for well, about 150 years now, and I didn't know what a learning disability was. I, I had no idea. In fact, I'll be honest, I didn't even know there was a nursing specialism called learning disability, which is quite interesting. So we just put that up to start off with, and, and I think the other important thing, and we, we find this with our colleagues in Welsh Government, is the understanding that this is a lifelong condition. And so all of Welsh Government policies need to be cradle to grave. Um, it's estimated that there's about 62,000 people in Wales with a learning disability, and just under 4,000 of them are aged between 14 and 17. But whilst that's relatively small numbers, it does actually mean for services they need to be thinking about this population when they're developing their services. So Wales has got quite a, a, a long tradition of groundbreaking action to support people with a learning disability. And it was the first in the UK to pioneer the development of small scale community facilities. And I think for a number of years now, there has been an emphasis on people having the right to an ordinary everyday life with the right support to live well. And Jane said earlier that Paul had the right to equal treatment. And I think for me, what resonates so much is that if you go on the MENCAP website, Learning Disability Wales website, or Wales People's First websites, they make statements about people having the right to equal treatment. What I find uncomfortable about that statement is that you and I don't have to say that. We already have that right. So embedded in our programme is that. But as Jane pointed out, and as you certainly saw from the uh, Ruth's presentation, we still, there is a long way to go. So back in 2016, Jean White, the Chief Nursing Officer, had a conversation with Mark Drakeford and Vaughan Gethin and said, we're not getting it right for people with a learning disability in Wales. There are premature deaths, avoidable deaths, their treatment isn't as good as it should be, and we need to do more about it. Will you support me? And they said yes. So there was a comprehensive review undertaken across Wales. Something like two and a half thousand people took part in this review. So they spoke to um, all of the public services in Wales. They talked to individuals with a learning disability, parents, families, carers, and they ended up with 24 recommendations that cut right across Welsh Government. So it cuts across health, education, housing, social care, employment and transport. That went to the Welsh Government Cabinet, who accepted all of the recommendations in full, and the Improving Lives programme was launched in June last year. So it's got full cross-party support, so every single Assembly member in Welsh Government signed up to deliver in this programme. And we have a ministerial advisory group that oversees the delivery of, of the programme. And the reason for doing that is it gives, it kind of gives it a bit of profile because that ministerial advisory group is independent to Welsh Government, so they actually have unfettered access to ministers and they basically hold me to account. Um, we've put together some of the slides, we've put together some of the, the sort of the key um, actions. Um, I'm not gonna go through them all, you'll be relieved to know. But um, what we will do is, along with the uh, 
presentation, I'll include a copy of the latest um, monitoring report of all of to tell you it shows you exactly what progress has been made against each of the 24 actions. So we'll we'll uh, let you have that as well. But just as an example, and, and this is one that's very close to the heart of all of the healthcare professionals that I work with, is about reducing inappropriate use of medication and restraint and by increasing uh, evidence-based interventions for things like positive behavioural support. And we actually have a, a, a task and finish group looking at that. And what we actually want to do with this one is it's actually about educators having that skill. So, that, so it's not always about health. It, and this is, this is the challenge, is that a, a challenge for me as well, but is to, is to get that, the wider public service sector to understand this is about everything they do. It's not a health issue. So we've got a number of um, actions on uh, housing, and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later. But effectively, it's about integrated uh, packages of care and support, and appropriate too. Um, I was having a conversation with Katie, the Chief Officer, in the um, Families Forum, the All Wales Families Forum. She has a brother with a learning disability. And what Katie was saying is that they look at housing solutions for a person with a learning disability and they don't think about the age. So, you know, this, so the same housing solution will be offered to someone at 18 as it might be offered to someone at 59. Um, social care, as you would imagine, there's a whole raft of actions around social care and a particular emphasis on health and social care working better together. We're not there yet, by no means. But that, that is actually one of my missions in life. And then the health ones, which Hazel will be talking about in more detail later. And we have a whole raft of actions around education, skills, and employment, because people with a learning disability have, should have the same rights that we have to lead a full life with a job. So some of these are, are around helping to underpin services. Um, one in particular I'm, what I'm working on now is, is this, this one around the, when, they, when the inspection bodies conduct reviews, um, they don't necessarily talk to people with a learning disability or their families and carers. So um, we've, ha we've already had a conversation the other day, didn't we, yeah. Hazel, about, about this with, with uh, the, what are they called, the National Collab Collaboration Unit? They, National they in Collab Commissioner. Yeah. Unit. Is it Sheen's unit? Yeah, yeah. They, they, they actually inspect units outside of Wales and in Wales where for um, placements and we, we've had a conversation with them about the need for them to engage more with uh, families, carers and individuals. So, I think I'm over to, uh, I think I'm over to you now Hazel. <coughs> to play. That wasn't me. In Bucklings, they clap now. <laughs> they go, we clap. Well done. The voice is holding. Karen's going to come back, so hopefully the voice will, will hold. So I'm Hazel Powell. I'm Nursing Officer for Mental Health and Learning Disability, currently working with Karen and Jean White's team at Welsh Government. Um, I'm seconded from my post as Nurse Director for Mental Health and Learning Disability in what is currently, what is now Swansea Bay University Health Board. I'll have to remember the change. Um, so come from a practice background. I'm a mental health nurse and a learning disability nurse and I've spent a, a lot of my career working in learning disabilities so it's really good to be involved in this work and, and, and try and help take it forward. So I'm going to talk just a little bit more detail around the health actions which basically cover four key areas. The areas we're interested in trying to make a big difference in are around primary care, secondary care, specialist services and then children's services and I'll talk a little bit more uh, very briefly about each of them but again we're around all day. If people want to come and speak to us and get some more detail we're very happy to have those conversations. 
So, um, delivery of the health action so far. Some of the things that we've done so far is we've uh, found some additional funding for two million, which is always gratefully received. Uh, that was announced in March, and that's to do two things. A lot of that funding's went into Public Health Wales, and that's to fund a number of posts, of, posts of which Paul is one. So we wanted clinical leads to lead out over those four areas, the primary care, uh, secondary care, specialist services, children's work that we want to drive. We felt it was important to have individuals to lead that work out and support health boards to look at and make the changes we want them to, to, to do. So we're thrilled to bits with the team that Public Health Wales has pulled together for that work and we will be looking forward to working with them and holding them to account. So. No pressure, Paula. <laughs> um, so some of the money's went for that, which is great. We've also given some money out to the health boards and that, and it particularly focused that money around trying to increase capacity, particularly around uh, liaison nurses, um, pr primary health care checks and, and, and children. So we've not been overly pres prescriptive, but we have... Um, we have been a little bit prescriptive. We wanted to make sure it was spent and, and spent for um, spent on things that will create additionality for boards. So not just add to what they're doing, but to create some additionality. So that's great. And we're seeing some of that funding go into some of those um, additional liaison nurse posts that Jane talked about. We're getting some really exciting, uh, innovative proposals back for boards, which I think will really help us test out some of, of, of the recommendations and actions that we want to take forward. So looking forward to that. The primary care health actions are really all around the annual health check and there's a theme today when you look at the programme and see what's been talked about today, there's a real theme around annual health checks and I think Ruth outlined extremely well why, you know, why we need to do annual health checks. But what we want to do from a, a government um, position is make sure they're ex accessed and meaningful. So, uh, and it's around that early identification, it's around that recognising that people with learning disabilities may well present differently and if we miss things, uh, the outcomes are, are much poorer. So there's a number of things that we've been doing. We've been looking at the specification for annual health checks um, and we're looking at making sure that's refreshed and has the most up-to-date evidence base in it. We're looking at trying to look at different models to support GP practices to ensure they can deliver on their annual health checks. So what might, what does it always have to be a GP? Could it be a nurse? Could it be a learner? What are the different models in a, when we're trying to look at prudent health care that can be used to get the outcome of somebody having an annual health check that's of a high quality because that's the outcome uh, we're looking for. And we're all, and we're working, and I know uh, that Linda's but Wheels are talking later, so I'll try not to steal too much of their thunder, thunder. But we're also looking at things like making sure people have uh, good information. We standardise letters across Wales. We're we're a, a small enough country. I actually once said to Jean White, "We're a small country," and she gave me that look. She can give you. She's got that look, and she went, "No, we're a perfectly sized country." So, so I'll better rephrase that. So we're a perfectly sized country that we should be able to work really well together, and we should be joined up even though it's incredibly complex systems we work in so but we should be able to have standardized letters for annual health checks and standardized information and give gps information they're really busy they're not going to be experts in learning disabilities they're not going to know everything but so we need to support them in terms of information and training so they need to know to look out for things that are different that again ruth Touched on, touched on. So for instance, somebody with Down syndrome is likely to have narrowed ear canals, so they're likely to have lots of ear infections and problems with ears. So you know, it's useful to know that if you're going to do an annual health check. People with Prader-Willi syndrome are going to um, be um, inclined to put on weight, they're going to, you've got damaged hypothalamus, they're not going to feel satiated, they've got floppy muscles, so it's going to be harder for them to lose weight. It's helpful to know those things if you're doing an, an annual health check on somebody. And we can't expect GPs or practice <coughs> nurses to have all that information in, in their heads at all times. So we need to provide that information for them. Um, some of the challenges around annual health checks, I'll, I'll, I'll very briefly, because I'm sure they'll come up, uh, touched on the knowledge and skills in primary care and how we support that, but also quite often people will come along for a, an annual health check and not be able to communicate as Ruth mentioned, and they'll come along with a carer who doesn't know them, or as just you know, there's been a swap or a change, and they don't have the information they need. So that so that that's a, a waste of time for that person and for that GP. So it's looking at how we improve the quality of the annual health checks as well as we want them to be happening more often, and we want them to uh, be of a good quality. So they're meaningful because if you go to one or two and they're not meaningful, you're not going to go again when you're invited back the next time. Okay, so. Oh, see, 
I shouldn't do these fancy things. Just keep it simple so that I know where I'm at. So uh, we've also, all Wales, all health boards of Wales have adopted the HEF, which is the Health Equalities Framework, which looks at the social determinants of health. And it's um, uh, an assessment or tool you can use to uh, complete the, the, the HEF before you do an intervention and after. So it helps look at outcomes. So we also want to pull that work wider, look at making sure we've got meaningful outcomes for people with learning disabilities, which fits well wider piece of work that's going on across Wales around outcomes generally. We have um, some work around health passports and how, and how they work and how useful they are. We want to kind of refresh the care bundles that Jane talked about, make sure we've got all the up-to-date information in them that people need. We're looking at a universal health passport because, again, it's not just people with learning disabilities that would benefit from some of the work we're looking at is all vulnerable groups. So if you had a universal health passport that gave you information about a, a person who maybe can't give you that information themselves, that would be really helpful uh, in, in, in acute care and in primary care and in other health settings. So that's the second. So the second care is really focused on that, how pe people's experience when they go into acute general hospitals. Uh, and, and Jane's covered that re really well uh, already. Um, and the other thing we want to look at is our specialist services. So that's our learning disability specific services. So where our um, learning disability staff are working. So assessment treatment units, uh, some of some residential units, long stay units, and our community learning disability teams. And Shane Mills and the team at the National Collaborative Commissioning Unit, I wrote it down so that I, I would remember, uh, have just done a bit of work for us, a, a big bit of work. They've done two bits of work for us, actually. One uh, around children's services in the back of the Children's Commissioner in England, who, who some of you might remember talked about children living in mental health hospitals, children with learning disability and autism living in mental health, health hospitals. We wanted to know where our children are and you know, and, and what, what are they in the right place. So there's 11 children from Wales with mental health um, and autism, none of them actually have a learning disability, that are living in services in England, or currently in services in England um, in mental health hospitals. So we, we've, we've just received that, that review and we're looking at it and, and there'll be some information there. On, on the plus side, um, the, of those 11, Nine of them are in the right place, the review, at, for, at this point in time, uh, but two of them obviously then aren't, so the commissioners are going to be asked to look at how they step them down or get them into the right place. On the, uh, you know, on the, uh, the, the other side, it also looks at medication use and blanket restrictions, so lots of really interesting information that we want to review and consider and think about. So. The, that review is also done um, a much bigger bit of work for us, not, not him on his own, or he'll never do anything else, but his team, where they've reviewed everybody with a learning disability in an NHS provision or in an NHS funded provision. So that's massive. I can't, I can't remember the numbers, but it's massive amount of people in Wales and in England. So he's been all around all our assessment treatment units, all the specialist residential services in Wales and in England, and done this review. So there's lots of data that they're crunching at the moment and having a good look at, and there'll be recommendations come for that. But again, the early signs are it's telling us things we probably already know, and there's a lot of information that we'll hear today that actually we've known for some time. And for me, there's something about how we really drive some change around that, that people with learning disabilities are um, experience high levels of of antipsychotic and anxiolytic medication, uh, that there are blanket restrictions, that we are using restrictive practices in, in some of our services. So, so that information will be helpful to know, and that's why we want to review it. We also want to review our community learning disability teams, but I'll, brief, I'll come back on to that in a minute. One of the other issues for us is uh, around our workforce and is looking at specialist services here and, and nursing in particular. So learning disability nursing, like all the other fields of nursing and all the other professions in our health services, is facing the same challenges in recruitment. Uh, it's hard to recruit, it's hard, uh, we, we need to recruit, we also need to retain and look after our staff and give them good opportunities. We're trying to rein profile obviously we try to raise the profile of learning disability nurses uh, in Wales. We've got the same challenges but we have additional challenges and, and Karen kind of touched on it. Some people don't know that learning disability nurses exist. Uh, some people know they exist but don't know what they do. So there's a real image challenge there around A, getting ourselves known and understood. Um, so there's some work we're doing around developing some case studies and Ruth helping working with us for that bit, myth busting and case studies about careers uh, in learning disability nursing and, and what you can do and where you can work um, 
and we're linking in with the Train Work Live campaign to, to do some of that work. And So keep an eye out, there'll be more products coming onto that website, hopefully. We're going to try and do a new feature. It's 100 years of Learn Disability Nursing this year. Some of you will have been involved in the celebrations uh, and we're going to try and do a feature on Learn Disability Nursing and Mental Health Nursing over the, the remainder of the year. We're lucky in Wales, we've still got the bursary, but the bursary isn't necessarily the answer to everything, but we're in uh, probably a better position in England for, for that. And opportunity, oh, see, I'm doing it again. I do need to calm down with my <laughs> flying in stuff. So opportunities, some of the things that um, we, we, we want to do that are more of an opportunity than embedded in, in the current work programme. We look into mainstream and join up policies wherever possible. It's really important that we do that. So, for instance, Karen's been talking to our policy teams in Welsh Government that are looking at transition. So there's work going on at the moment looking at health transition from paediatric services into adult health services. And we're trying, we've got some agreement that learning disabilities will feature highly in that. So, for instance, we'll use examples and case studies of people with learning disabilities and respiratory disorders so that they will be the examples of, of transition and, and we'll help look at that. So it's some really good work going on and similar work around unscheduled care. I think we need to describe what an optimum model for specialist services looks like. It's different across Wales. It's it, you know, some quite massive variation about what our community learning disability teams do, what our assessment teams do, admission criteria, pathways, very different really in some parts of Wales. So I think there's an opportunity for us to review that and describe what that optimum uh, model should look like and to look at age blind services very briefly. Um, I said the fourth area was around children's services and we, we know that our children uh, are being born with very complex health needs. I need to stop, help. Um, can we have another two minutes so I can hand back to Karen to finish off? So really, so I'll just stop there because I can talk about children over lunch if people are interested. There you go, Karen, you've got last two slides. I just want to pull it back up to, to programme level and just um, also mention that in addition to the £2 million that's been given to health boards, there's a £100 million transformation fund uh, which North Wales have used and they've got about, I think about three, 3 million of that to completely transform their learning disability services across health and social care across the whole of the North Wales patch. Uh, it's going to be an interesting one to see how that develops. And there's also a £124 million integrated care fund. And I'm starting to see from the Regional Partnership Board spending plans that there, there's quite a bit of money going into uh, developing integrated, new integrated models of care across housing, uh, social care and health. And it's, it's, they're still maturing, but that's starting to look... I'm feeling quite optimistic about that, I have to say. And I just wanted to mention that Cardiff and Vale, North Wales and West Glamorgan have all got major proposals for the redesign of their learning disability health and social care services. Um, North Wales are, are, are well on the way. Uh, Cardiff and Vale have just launched theirs. And it is focusing on um, independent living, loc locally provided support with step up, step down. Um, oh, I've done one of them myself, I forgot about that, yeah. Thing. So <laughs> all of the 24 actions are actually, this is the 24 actions in the Improving Lives programme. They're actually embedded in Welsh Government's policy direction. And we review this every six months and I hold um, policy colleagues to account and provide the kind of grit in the machine to, to deliver that. And as I said earlier, we'll provide the latest report which was produced in June. And we will keep our feet on the gas pedal. Done. Thank you.